work with on the computer. I didn't know. Yeah. Oh, I know you were talking about that one. Jimi Hendrix, Nirvana, and Pink Floyd. 
Another difference between this album and Cuddy's previous albums is his announcement that he, this would be his first album sober from cocaine, and this would be his first rock album where he would not cuss or rap. Specifically on February 29, 2012, things came to a head when Cuddy found out that his distributor, distributor Universal Republic, only released 55,000 copies of his album, an action that would provoke Cuddy to go on Twitter to air his frustrations with his then um, 500,000 followers. Wizard went on to debut at number three on the Billboard um, 200, behind Adele's 21 and, and Whitney's The Greatest Hits. This is interesting to note, considering that this is the week after Houston's untimely death, and Adele, and a week after Adele's highly anticipated first Grammy performance after throat surgery. So thus, Wizard was also Billboard's highest ranking new album like that. Considering that Kid Cudi is um, considered primarily a rapper, and hip hop artists are often not underfunded, it is not a surprise that a rapper to a rock star, especially a rapper who's reporting under a new name, would receive the treatment Cuddy received. However, it's not like it hasn't been done before. For example, Lil Wayne found success with the release of his gold certified rock album, Reverb. But its success was dwarfed by the success of Lil Wayne's multi platinum certified and a slightly more urban albums, The Carter Three and The Carter Four, which were released before and after Reverb. Using this logic, with arguably the most successful rapper of the day cannot sell a rap album, nobody can. Also, it pushes industry executives to continue to pressure rappers to evoke a persona easily understood, familiar, and marketable. Hyper-masculinity is considered to go hand in hand with hip hop, and is on a long list of criticisms, uh, criticisms of the genre, along with excessive violence, sexual content, and degradation of women. In hip hop awards, Trisha Rose states, mainstream white consumers drive hyper-demand of these images. Whites are raised on images of black thugs, images that appeal and seem authentic to white, thereby fueling higher sales given the, the size of the white consumer market, which then encourages unscrupulous corporations to demand more of these images to make greater profits. However, there are also larger societal pressures that only make the representation of black men as a thug seemingly authentic, but also extremely necessary. The construction of the stereotypical hip hop thug is partially explained by Patricia L. Collins' discussion of black men and hegemonic masculinity. Hill Collins argues that the construct of hegemonic masculinity is glorified in American culture and is defined by white men in opposition to oppressed groups. <coughs> she states, in the American context, hegemonic masculinity becomes defined through its difference from an opposition to women, boys, poor, and working class men of all races and ethnicities, gay men, and black men. In other words, no one is a real man but a rich white man at all, which automatically leaves the vast majority of rappers out. Hill Collins argues that pressure to meet this more hegemonic masculinity manifests in hyper-masculine behavior. Specific to black males in hip-hop culture, promiscuity suggests the power over women, interpersonal crime and opulent consumption speaks to a desire for respect, and homophobic statements and lyrics work to associate rappers from homosexuality. No homo. <laughs> Most of the research discussing masculinity in hip hop examines the personas of male rappers in the 1990s and the um, 2000s. Since this time, rapper Jay Z's persona has evolved from a street corner hustle, hustler to a corporate business mogul. Hip hop has also seen the mass success of rappers such as Kanye West, Drake, and Lil Wayne, who trouble hip hop gender and fashion norms. However, each of these wildly successful rappers either debuted invoking a thug ethos or were ushered in by a respected mentor who evoked this ethos. In order to understand what is at stake with Cuddy's resistance to societal and industry pressures and, and his eventual success, I will be using Q's rhetorical trope of Bring It Wreck as delineated in her 2004 book, Check It While I Wreck. Bring It Wreck is a hip hop phrase that was traditionally used to signify someone doing an act to a supreme level. Q provides examples such as rappers wrecking the microphone, break dancers wrecking by outdancing everyone on the floor, or even Mother Nature Bring It Wreck through tropical storms. However, empowered by the legacies and rhetorical practices of black women in tech, such as Terry McMillan's Wade Excel and Alice Walker's The Color Purple, Pew uses Bring and Wreck to describe black women's speech acts, such as talking back, going off, or acting a nigga bitch. Pew describes Wreck as a rhetorical act that has close ties with various free speech practices that show re re shows resistance. To explicate Bring and Wreck, Pew uses the empowering lyrics of female rappers like Queen Latifah, Lil Kim, and um, Foxy Brown which challenged racism and patriarchy by carving out a space in the public sphere and critiquing the oppressor. While I'm not ignoring um, the black women's speech practice that Pew contextualizes her presentation of rap in, I intend to expand this construct of bringing rec beyond aesthetics, yet still use it in a hip-hop context, and also to, con 
to critique larger capitalist forces that aim to keep petty stock. By releasing a rock album, he walks through a seldom passed through door for black musicians like Living Color, Phoebe Dobson, and Lenny Kravitz. It is a resistance to rigid musical boundaries dictated by color. However, there are three time periods where Cuddy exhibits his ability to bring rest. These include Cuddy's brief Twitter promotion of the album, his response to the release of his album, and his response to the success of his album. However, for the second time, I'll be focusing simply on Cuddy's um, response to the release of Wizard. After learning about the under-release of Wizard, Cuddy immediately took to Twitter to air his grievances. The rant, the rant acts as the centerpiece of Cuddy's dispute with Universal on the Republic. He tweets, okay, so heads up, my weak-ass label only shipped 55K physicals because they treated this like some indie side project tax write-off. So I apologize on behalf of my weak-ass major label. He, continue, he continues to go off by tweeting, and I apologize for the lack of promo. Again, my weak-ass major label. Cuddy boldly talks back to his um, record company. He questions their support of the own um, project. He cusses them out by repeatedly calling them weak asses. Cuddy then tweets that because of his label's actions, he decided to postpone his solo career to pursue another wizard project. Quote, or he tweets, they tried to rush me through this so I can give them another Man on the Moon 3. But guess what? Fuck that. Next album is Wizard. Man on, Man on the Moon 3 on hold to 2014, he declared. Then he continued to tweet, who mad, not me or Dr. Genius, is producing. Cuddy claims agency and control by vowing to delay his project. This statement moves from the symbolic to the pragmatic. This usurping of control from the oppressor functions to discipline the record label into compliance. However, based on, on, the early, on my earlier discussion, the compliance of Universal Republic seems very unlikely. Not to mention his plan is flawed. Doing another Wizard album first out of spite does not solve the issue of underdistribution, uh, under nor does it cross the task of recording another hip hop album, album off the list. It merely delays it, which suggests that usurping of power is probably only temporary, at least if he wants to participate in, the, uh, in this capitalist marketplace. Later, the good music rapper and singer warned fans that finding the Wizard album in stores would be difficult, adding that the label never sent him a copy of his own album. He tweets, I gotta go out and find one too, because my weak ass label never, never even gave me it. <laughs> gave us a copy of all the album, he wrote. He also complains about the company's failure to, um, to serve the single Teleport to Me Jamie to Raven. He continues to talk back and criticize Universal Republic by calling them weak, which, would, would, which could be weakness of will, weakness of resources, or just simply whackness. And plays up the pathos by calling into question the morals and decency of the, um, the label. He does this by sharing their omission to provide them with a copy of his own CD, presumably because they do not appreciate his talent and artistry. Lastly, Cuddy continues to antagonize his label and even hypothesizes the potential consequences. He tweets, I'm letting um, Universal Republic have it. Fuck it. What are they going to do? Spank me? Ha ha ha. In this statement, Cuddy, an autonomous being that is a, a threat to the record company and their privileged knowledge, um, sarcastically ponders the potential consequences for going off on his record company on Twitter. In conclusion, Kid Cudi brings wreck by taking agency and talking back to the industry, which is seldom seen. His actions present a public blow to the omnipotent control of the industry. However, Cudi does not destroy the heart of the issue. The music industry as a capitalist enterprise that keeps circulating familiar yet potentially harmful and monolithic images of black men and hip-hop artists. Tumors such as patriarchy and racism are still able to circ well, cancers of um, patriarchy and racism are still able to circulate their ideology through the industry. However, it would be ludicrous <coughs> to believe that several tweets from Kid Cudi could single-handedly destroy this control, but the movement of more and more artists to sell albums independently suggests that there is something brewing in the industry. Not to mention, thanks to Twitter, what would, would have been seen as simply just another recording artist going off in a record studio now had, was broadcast around the world. Thank you.
just put them in. It took, <laughs> it took me so long to find them. And I just turned off my phone. <laughs> because he changed it from when I did the um, paper. But give me a second. I'll let you know. to help me situate 
why there's a need to recreate space or disrupt time uh, or to be alien, you know, in, in a way to uh, project a stronger identity. And so uh, subjectivity I look at as a space for resistance uh, in, in reclamation of identity and, and other things. But black subjectivity specifically has and continues to be an important part of articulating the lived experiences of people of African descent throughout art, literature, and other forms of culture. Although widely associated with postmodernism theorizing, subjectivity, especially the discourse surrounding black subjectivity, expands beyond the limitations of postmodernism. However, postmodern era has certainly become a significant framework to discuss these subjectivities with more nuance and depth, as postmodernism calls for new and critical ways of thinking about art and the artist. In postmodern blackness, Bill Hooks talks about the gap between theorizing otherness and difference, as well as black people's lived experience and culture as it relates to postmodernist concepts of blackness. However, her implementation of radical black subjectivity as it means to fill in the gap <coughs> divided in terrain, which I can think about black subjectivity, could also be post-colonial. Um, Hooks identifies the existing ways uh, that the, academy, uh, the academic discourse surrounding the black experiences discussed in the post, they're problematic. So she also advocates for new ways to resist uh, the existing marginalization while suggesting ways that the dialogue can embrace the cultural voice of black artists who have often uh, remained unacknowledged for their contribution uh, or their, their just unique, their unique performances within entertainment. Um, these existing problems that Hooks identifies have been chronicled before and permeate throughout the body of scholarship qualified uh, and recognized as adequate foundations of academic theorization because of the racializing and gendering of knowledge. Therefore, Hooks may speak of these existing problems with speciality, um, specific, specificity, y'all forgive me, uh, to the postmodern theory, but these problems regarding black subjectivity and visibility can be read in postcolonial conversations as well. And so the only reason why the interest uh, in crossing over between postmodernism, especially when it regards regarding art, is that the post-colonial talks about the artist and talks about their space in it as well as the art that they create and bringing those two conversations together. Um, and so with that in mind, then I ask the question of the work, is it possible that some of this disruption in time and space and the conversation that these women are having about their own bodies uh, is about possibly decolonization? and a gendering process or engendering of a decolonization in that way. So just really briefly, specifically looking at this piece, which is from New America Part Two, um, you know, there's such a contrast, there's a very bold contrast within the visual here. And I think that those who are very in tune with visual art can absolutely do a strong reading of it. But you see a lot of different elements, metal, nature, grass, dirt, and it's in stark contrast um, to one another. And so this is a very, a very strong kind of, a, I believe that Erica is saying something very specific about her body and about the place in which she's in, uh, in this way. I'm not sure where else metal belongs in gardens, but here it does and, and it works for what she wants to say. Um, and so the question is, what is she saying? And so Janelle Monet from Metropolis. I find this really interesting. Not only is she mechanical in this way, but in the music she identifies as an android, but she's also an alien android. And she has a complete identity shift, Cindy Mayweather. Uh, and the entirety of the album is characterized in that way, even though it's her voice and you know it. So and this is also a dismembered android. It's a broken body that is missing things. And so what is the conversation here that is you know, being spoken about the black woman's body in this performance as she is an alter ego, maybe might go that far and say that, or a character within her own work. Um, what does she want to say about black women's bodies? Or what is she saying about her own black female body in this context? So these are some of the visual pieces that brought even further this concept of uh, forming the alien inside of alienation here. So, um, so for Monet, there's a lot of displacement or space and displacement. For Badu, it's a lot of uh, time disruption. She definitely in 
one song can speak about the past and present in the same sentence even. Um, I know, for example, especially with the New America Part 2, I found it very interesting, even on first listening, uh, to when those people without the rest of the album when it first came out, thank you, uh, is that she spends such a significant time saying, you know, I want to be left alone. I want to be by myself. I don't want anyone here. And the next line is, I need you. I want you. I need to touch you. I need to feel you. And it's, it's very, you know, close together in terms of the concept. And so she's not She's in a past and she's in a present and not and longing for a future that's not not really there with her. So it's replicated in other ways, but that was something that I definitely that definitely stood out for me. So my hypothesis in these female artists um, say that through their performance, I am not from this space, I am not from this place or this time. Is this an identifying announcement that they are outsiders in every way? Or is it an act of defiance against a hegemonic culture which stakes so many claims on the black woman's body and all of its expectations that as an act of resistance, they reject the present in favor of creating a more unique and nuanced perspective of their lived experience, recreating their own subjectivity as women and as artists by signaling to a past and musing on a future uh, and futuristic, uh, retro-futuristic funk. Um, and perhaps is that a moment for them to be free uh, in a space where they are not because they, they have a moment of resistance to decolonize themselves. Um, one of the examples that stood out to me looking at other women who are not considered this type of unique body is, for example, Nicki Minaj, where the, uh, in the uh, TV documentary on women in hip hop, they are very clear about defining her as amalgamation of Little Kim, the sexualizing context of Little Kim, and looking at the outrageous antics of a Missy Elliott and very unique in style in that way, and then also pairing her with the lyricism and the you know the girl who can hang with the guys uh, type of element that Eve has, and so they can look at her and dissect her body and dissect her performance and decide who she is and where she got these pieces from, and is it the same possibility to do Janelle Monae in that same context? And I think that it's a very intentional, if you have to think longer than two seconds, you know, that she does not reference specifically any other artist or say so she's gone out of her way to recreate an identity that is not at least directly connected to another black woman's artist to disregard her unique approach to music um, and to provide a different opportunity for her to have another voice. So, The, in conclusion, and this was a really interesting conversation from, you know, just really giving so much props to this conference uh, in general. Um, and another panel, there was a discussion about outcasts. And so it's clear to me that this type of um, alienation is not only performed by women, that there are definitely men who are in that space. And so my question then became, well, what are those distinctions? Where does gender then uh, take men in a different context that women are either not going or feel that they maybe cannot go or they're attempting to defy those things um, in that conversation of embodying the alien or trying to make themselves more unique and distinct. And one question was about sexuality. So, you know, in outcasts can still talk very openly about sex and they can go into romance and they can, you know, talk about the erotic in a more complicated way as was uh, demonstrated in another panel. Uh, but if Erica Badu gets naked for three seconds on window seat video, then it's considered pornographic. We're now back to the body. We've dismissed everything else that's been said. You know, her interviews about what she was trying to communicate in her art in this guerrilla film, uh, in public, in space, and body, all of that is dismissed for these three seconds of nudity that is now considered completely pornographic. So now we're focused so much on the body that the mind, the words, the creativity, the art can be completely overlooked in that moment. And so is that then a space where uh, the gendering process continues to be, needs to be analyzed, where men possibly may be able to go in that particular way, that women either are disallowed or they have to be so defiant about attempting to do. Um, and then the last question that I ask is just about what does this mean? I guess what are the are there any consequences to being retrofuturistic? 
in signaling to the past and referencing to this future space, um, it does get obscure the present. And do these women have the opportunity, whether it's through an entertainment type of mannerism or in their own personal identity, uh, to be themselves right here and right now? And again, going back to such a powerful line, it's so simple. Uh, Erica Badu says in Gone Baby Gone, I don't want to time travel no more. I want to be here. And that desire to be present, um, or is it in order to maintain your validity as an entertainer, as a black woman, you must stay on the margin to be relevant in that way. So thank you so much for your time. She has to be the number one female rapper because there's only one, mm -hmm. right? which is very different than golden era hip hop, where you could have several female groups, several female rappers. Rappers can female rappers do a duet together and still be each other and not have to go at each other's throats. I hear what you're saying, but I'm going to push back just a bit because <coughs> yeah. I remember when Jill Scott came out and the first video, mm -hmm. of course, her hair was wrapped. And immediately, I mean, if we had a Twitterverse, it would have, you know, been that conversation. But immediately, I know the blogosphere went to, is this Erica Badu's replacement? You know, is she the one who's going to come and trump her? Because clearly, Jill has a completely different vocal range. And they were saying, well, her voice is stronger. And she's the one who was writing, you know, some of the songs for Erica. And so is she going to dominate her? So I think that same element of the gays in terms of competition still exists for women like that. But I think that even more so that why I get the sense that artists like Erica and Janelle Monae do so much more to say, you're, I'm going to make this hard for you. If you want to try to stack me up against somebody, you're going to have to work so much harder because I am going to be that unique and that set aside and that creative. I, I guess my point was only just that it seems to me, you guys correct me if I'm wrong, it seems to me that Nicki Minaj plays very directly into it. In, like, in other words, in other words, I don't I don't hear Erica Badu doing diss records or mm -hmm. subliminal disses of Jill Scott. Mm -hmm. yeah. Someone in the back. So that's what I was talking about. Yeah, yeah. I hear that. She has to say I'm a female hip hop artist, and she has to say I'm a female hip hop artist. 
she has to accentuate her, her sexuality and her femininity. And, and I think it's just it's just that time that we talk right now where we, she can't go beyond that, whereas Erica Badu is known and you have had so many, you know, you've had our you've had spirituals, you've had spirituals, you've had gospel, you've had everything in terms of vocals before that, where it, it's their time now where they don't have to say I'm anymore. They don't, they don't have to pretend themselves to it. Whereas hip hop, it, we're not, I don't think we're very and I, I, I wonder a little bit if that's a desire for us to get to. Like, there's something about hip hop itself that relies on the battle and the competition, right? And so, what will we be losing? But I mean, there's definitely something to be said, especially for the women, because we're always seen as being competitive, right? So, I'd like to, to follow Erica Badu on Twitter and her reach out to Salon to say, This is my little sister, right? Like, we like that kind of thing to see in places where you want to put artists against each other and they resist that. But at the same time, there's something that comes out of Hip hop's origin, you know, with this, this, you know, um, coming from the trajectory of playing the dozens and, and things like that, that like maybe we don't want to be so cool by y'all, right? right, right, right. Yeah, I see your thought. Um, hello. Two, two things. Um, I was gonna in it. Yeah. Uh, I really, I really found uh, conversations about Metropolis dope because it seems like Metropolis is like that 1930s silent film where there's room to kind of present my own representation of my own femininity and discourse, whereas that's not available within this contemporary moment of black popular culture, especially uh, commercial hip hop. So I'm curious about um, the role of, of science, like science fiction, because uh, Janelle did that, and also Beyonce did it in her little, you know, BET Awards uh, performance. She took the, when they were putting her together. So this idea of construction, of the body within a commercial space is particularly interesting for me in the light of this conversation. And then on the second part of that, I'm also a Southern hip hop scholar and I'm from Georgia. So when we were talking about Outcast, of course my ears perked up a little bit more than we should have. Um, <laughs> but my question is, if we're thinking about constructions of space, I can't help but think about the role of the South, the trajectory of the South within commercial hip hop culture. When, when Southern hip hop first got on the map, it was an alien land. There was, you know, there was no such thing as rap within hip hop. So when you have folks like Three Stacks come out and say the South has something to say, uh, what kind of what kind of dichotomies are presented there? Where there's like this pushback. So when they were talking about being ATL aliens and all that good stuff, I'm really curious about um, in what ways can we use that to contextualize this idea that even within the United States that there are still alien spaces, and how do we think about black bodies within those alien spaces in the U.S. So I'm kind of curious if we could take the conversation in that direction. Yeah. Even cool Keith and refers to that when he talks about Earth people in New York and California, Earth people out born on Jupiter mm -hmm. in the context of all these folks, that's what it's saying. I, I, don't, I don't know the, the necessarily the style of, 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 of the circle, but um, I, I am a little uh, perplexed or even maybe vexed by our, um, I don't know, disavow or even dismissal of the political um, implications of someone like a Nicki Minaj versus a Janelle Monet. Even that presupposes a, com a competitive right, um, energy that starts with questions that are problematic, right? So my thing is, what is the radical potential of either? Right? Versus having to say, you know, for example, that the, the, the feminine right is being being offered up an outcast. Well there are also other moments where I might argue that it's not as much the feminine as it is maybe woman as a category might be in a particular style of woman, right? Because it's not like, you know, um, you know, Queen Latifah from Set It Off that is being desired. But it's I mean you, you get what I'm saying? So so how can we begin to think maybe more radically about this? And one of the ways that I'm, I'm thinking through this is that there is, and I even thought about this with your paper too, Seth, um, that there's a traveling between utopias and dystopias, right? So there is, it is not just a utopic experience of radical subjectivity, right? Um, but it's also the fact that we also exist within dystopias. Right, things that we don't want, right? Black folks. I mean, you know, um, you know, things that we deal with that, that the world feels. I mean, Chicago, right? I'm like, oh, you know. But at the same time, there's also a utopic space in Chicago for me, right? A nostalgic space, and so all of that is working to construct the subject 
in, in particular ways. And for me, even talking about the Southern Hip Hop Scholar, uh, to the Southern Hip Hop Scholar about Nicki Minaj, I mean, I actually think we can include her in, in that as a radical subject within the vein of su Southern Hip Hop, right? We don't think of her that way, right? But she comes out of the, the Louisiana Lil Wayne School. I mean, she's from New York and Trinidad, but there is a kind of hybridity that we have to address. And I'm wondering about that, that those questions of complications and, 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 and what is really being produced. Thank you. <laughs> I, no, I see what you're saying. I mean, when I, when I mentioned outcasts earlier, it was just in reference to talk yesterday. But what I think is important, I mean, I wasn't trying to say that Nicki Minaj should be judged against these other women. What I was really trying to say, thinking about the title of this panel, is that there's something about the way the hip hop industry has changed mm -hmm. that when we look at female rappers, the assumption is that there's going to be one at the top. And then the question becomes, how does that institutional or corporatized space, how does, how does that agenda complement or take away from, like you were saying, the, the, bad, the complex, competitive nature that should be, that is hip hop. Right? I, so I think we have to think about the relationship between those things more. The other, but the other thing, too, that I think is important about what you just said about Nicki Minaj being from New York, right, is that on the one hand, the South remains this alien space, and yet this alien space is taking over hip-hop, right? So that you have someone, like my students love ASAP Rock, and ASAP Rock does not sound like a Harlem build to me. Like, it, uh, generationally speaking, it does not make sense that I can hear ASAP Rock's new album, and I hear when he sides Scarface, I hear when he sounds like Bone, I hear when he sounds like Three Six Mafia. Mm -hmm. So there is so on the one hand, on the one hand, there, there's something about this alien space that precisely because of the alien is actually attracted more people to it. What the full political implications are, I'm not sure. But you know, I can't tell you how many times brought up I had to defend this album. And now, now that the South has, in a way, I can't say it's become hegemonic, yet it has still, it, it hasn't become hegemonic, and yet it still fills space. But then, when I hear people say, what's wrong with hip hop now? They say it's because the South took over. Uh, right? So there's still people uncomfortable uh, with this alien space that yet keeps growing bigger and bigger. Right? And more people are embracing it. Like ASAP embraces being here. So in that way, I guess that's what I was trying to do. Rocky, who, you know, is pulling from a particular trajectory that we're all familiar with in hip-hop. You know, remember when Crips came on, every hip-hop artist had to show their copy of Scarface, right? And so we know, like, this particular lineage, right, and therefore, that is hip-hop. So regardless of what his dialect sounds like, we know he's hip-hop, right? Whereas somebody like Kid Cudi, who's pulling on these different folks, like, it makes us wonder, like, is that hip-hop? Or those kids from Our Future Wolf Gang kill them all? I'm like, what? Like, this? Who, who are you listening to? I'm always wondering that, right? And so I think we're also in a, in a time period where we're also questioning, like, what makes hip-hop hip-hop? Like, what makes hip-hop music that? Is it that you're, if you rap, no matter what the beat is or what you're pulling from or what the content is, is, is that what makes it hip-hop? Is it, you know, particular uh, things that show up in your video? So, so where are we? And are we actually on the cusp of a new music form? I really think you bring up a good point because it really makes me think through also artists like Chris Brown, Trey Songz, Frank Ocean, who are R&B singers, but I would make an argument hip -hop, that are, right? are hip hop. And Mary J. Thank you. And I would also argue like if you were to listen to Wizard, it's a rock album, but like you you definitely know um, it's dripping with hip hop. You know the the um the type of subjects the way he deals with the the, um, the words he use, uses are very you know reminiscent. And I think in particular these alien bodies within hip hop are the ones that are making us question what the form is, has it evolved? I mean, there was a time where, you know, it was it was something else. Hip hop wasn't always here. And so maybe we're about to be with you know, maybe you, if you could more comfortably put Kid Cudi, Janelle Monet, Erica Badu, even Kanye West sometimes, into a, a whole new form of music. Maybe there's something else we're discussing. Well, they all. Um, I think it's really interesting when you talk about the alien bodies within hip hop. 
I think it would be interesting to think about the people kind of masquerading as alien or unavailable in some form. I can't help but think of at the BBC Awards when Jamie Foxx was introducing Django for the first time, the first time you see the trailer. He said, this movie is violent, it's this, it's that, it's hip hop. And the way he was using this phrase to evoke something uh -huh. densely complicated, I don't know what, I'm not sure Django is hip hop. You know what I'm saying? But the, we can just throw it out there. Because both <laughs> I mean, I don't know, I don't know, but I'm just saying, it seems like there's an issue of access, and so we can just stamp hip-hop on anything that feels hard to get at. So, in terms of alien also masquerade, like, hip-hop also masquerades as alien when it is not at all. When it is the most explicit, clear, you know. And who owns it, right? So there's also always that conversation, the reason why the New Yorkers get so upset that Southern you know, that, like they took over hip hop is because they felt that they owned it. All the top artists from back in the day all came from, you know, the New York area. So they felt like they owned that, you know, particular thing. Yeah. Um, do you think the that the that deals with how a genre is changed in relation to capitalism? Well, I think as a teenager, as a teenager, I grew up in the DC area, and we listened to Go Go, Rare and all that. And it was like the New York guys were doing rap, and then my friends from Chicago, Detroit area, house music. That's what I'm trying to say. So I just look at it, when they talk about the Southern thing, the South, I look at migration, that's where one of the black women lives in the yeah. South now. So I mean, that shift the last 30 years of reverse migration. Mm -hmm. Now, mm -hmm. so it was logically concluded that the South was going to have a disproportionate impact because that's where most blacks live now in the states of the old Confederacy. Nice. It's kind of like the old Confederate flag is now red, black, and green. Diaspora people because we're discussing, you know, those types of internal diasporas 
in terms of culture. So it's not tied to a geography because we're talking about all these different migrations that are happening. But even within hip hop, I mean, I think when we're talking about those aliens, you know, within it, from uh, margins to center, because they sort of de determine what happens at the core and it reverberates out and, you know, it echoes and, and has all these different synthesis. But hip hop is bounce music. Don't tell nobody from Louisiana I said that. But, you know, <laughs> hip hop is go go. I mean, all of these pieces, they are at least part and partial to that sound. The labeling of it, perhaps the title of how we call these things might differentiate. But when I first heard go go, I thought I was listening to my family's like bounce music. You know, I, that's what I thought that it was until I had to listen a little further to accents and, you know, colloquialisms and that kind of thing. But the sound and the energy that was there, it was just, just regional creation. So now that we're talking about technology and we're talking about, you know, internet and YouTube and all of these different things, there's less of, uh, you know, a nationalism that's, that's less far apart. You know, California is right next to New York if I want it to be. If I want to experience that sound and I want to be you know, that, that locality is right there and it's so much more accessible. So it's been fused and then refused and reused and sometimes, you know, utilized as a, a, a tool to get to the next level when those who are not as interested in it, but they know that it's popular, so I'm gonna use it. I wanna sound like Wale, I wanna do what he's doing, because that's unique, you know, he's coming from something that's different, so I'm just gonna replicate it even though I'm in Wisconsin, you know? So those types of things being a part of what's recreating what at least we are hearing as hip hop today. Which is how we end up with every rapper sounding like Drake on radio. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. First of all, man, I, I, I love this conference. It's awesome. Um, and I, I have so many, I have a lot of ideas like popped in my head. Um, I want to, there's several things I want to mention. And, um, one of the things is uh, I'm a visual artist as well as a visual, mm. visual scholar. And so I look at these particular types of images quite a bit. And this, um, this notion of embodiment has been very important between these particular, uh, these particular um, artists uh, in North Korea. And um, I can't help but look at like um, Janelle Monet's uh, kind of like connection. She was saying the scientific narratives. Uh, but the first thing when I saw when I, when I heard the album about the um, I know it's kind of like embodiment. Um, 
Yeah, yeah, conversations. There's some important about about too because you know, I did this series called Matters of Fact. It's like 72 cyborg, like cyborg images, where I kind of look at like the constructed like steel part of the country as like the socialized aspect of you know how we can like and so I look at that in general and the fleshy part of being kind of like how we see ourselves, you know, our actual selves, and then how that particular connection is always a negotiation of some kind, trying to sort of circumvent those boxes. So that. But also looking at the systems that, that have to uh, empower you know, that to like fuel that, that the nature of negotiation. I mean, so what that makes me think about, if I could just speak a little bit about that, is the consent. She consented, obviously, to be in the video. She consented to use her body yes. and to be naked in the video. But how far did her consent go in that way? And how much control did she have about the way that her body was going to be represented in that particular as to why she went to Twitter to say, yes, I agree to be a part of this project in this way, but this is not what I agree to say, that my body should be represented in that same context. So. Yeah, let's go here. Um, yeah, I just wanted to, in terms of the, the, the uh, there were a couple of things came up in this great conversation going on, but particularly with Badu, the ways in which the, the actual new body is not Badu. But Badu's sister is right. She's naked in the video, but she's not. Well, right, right, it's, yeah. Um, but also kind of thinking about the, the, the kind of conversations that, that we're having now about alienhood. And um, really, really more appreciated thinking about the way that this has manifested itself through DJ culture. And I'm thinking of these kind of very particular sonic collectivities around either DJ Shadow's relationship to Soul Side Records or DJ Hubert's relationship to the Invisible Scratch Pickles. But just particularly kind of these West Coast phenomena about how these communities of difference are formed. Um, and also particularly going back to ASAP Rocky, I think the thing which is most fascinating to me about him is that he deliberately just doesn't believe, he believes that hip hop is dead in the, in the context of New York. And that he deliberately looks elsewhere, particularly around. <laughs> like, I don't want to be another MC from New York because there's nothing progressive now going on in New York hip hop. So the way that he distances himself from that, I think, is fascinating. Just wanted to add a footnote to the conversation about the Black Bonnet's um, dress and attire from Black Girls Rock. She talked about um, why she wears. She calls it her uniform. <coughs> And she took it back to her work on class background and how she, every day she gets up and puts on this uniform. And so I'm thinking through this, and I don't know what this means also for her to be able to articulate that in this in this open space. And now we have to read her with her words, right? So we can talk about this, but we have to take into account that she said that this is a very political um, uh, choice that she made. And if we do want to put it in context with alien bodies, now we have to engage the conversation of what it means to be alien workers. Because she's not talking about um, working class and you know she's representing herself as a part of the working class even as she's an entertainer. So now we have to enter into the conversation of people on the ground and how she's representing you know for her people and the I was just comment on the, um, the, the kind of the biopolitics of Juno Lene versus Erica Lady. Well, May, I think her dude is, is the cyborg. I think that's the most sort of eroticized when she gets her of this kind of dismembered cyborg, which goes back to the video where she is in a sort of futuristic like slave auction as like the, um, the cyborg. So that's, I think, how like, she engages with it. And one thing with the, the alien workers think she's supposed to be kind of like this runaway. I think it's the, the narrative there, but going back to what like, Erica do, because the, the part, of the, the first Amer New America is considered to be the political one, and it's the Afro and, and, and she also says the masculine. Right, and the masculine. And then the next one is like the feminist, like the cyber one, and that's the, the, the personal one. That's, I don't know, and creates things a bit as a minor one, because it's not really about the classic sort of, you know, the system. But you know, I, I believe black love is existing. Right. Yeah, it's, 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 it just requires more work. Absolutely. I think 
Rush card. Rush, 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 yeah, Rush is probably a business man. <laughs> Rush. He's a part of that whole thing of uh, him wearing artificially promoted in a certain way. So they kind of then begin the exclusion of these other art forms, you know, that kind of end up hurting uh, the, 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 these other relationships, I think, temporarily. You know, I mean, but do you think each, each of these artists, the way they come to it, and the way they project their identities, have anything to do with anything related to education, production, and some of these other things? Um, as far as, like, say, the Wizard album, for instance, for Kid Cudi's Cudi fans, this album really wasn't that big of a leap or a surprise, I would say. Like, because he's always had those influences, and you could definitely read that with his um, upbringing, his story, being we're not like, for instance, look at what I'm, I don't know. his brand has always been within this kind of blurring of what hip hop is supposed to be. Like, you know, right, even when, when it comes to styling and hip -hop, like, it, 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 it really takes me back to this whole post black news conversation we had yesterday. Because, <laughs> like, really, like, his, his upbringing and his styling is like that. Like, whether it be taking the skinny jeans and the skateboarding and all that before it became so new, you know, the, the thing, like, that was his, you know, ego. Um, what I was going to say, for me, what your question sort of signals is going back to Nicki Minaj, and I am not interested in vilifying her or anyone else, so that's not even my gig. But the idea that people like to know when they hear from you, put themselves out there in a way to make it a lot more challenging to make them, you know, easy targets of comparison, that they're really unique, that they understand they might have a smaller marketability and audience because of their, the, the way that they present themselves versus the Nicki Minaj character who was constructed, you know, we're talking about visible constructor. I mean, she was, her identity was constructed to gain the most amount of appeal possible by you know, young money to put her out as the singular voice as a female. So in that particular way, um, I can separate them and, and not put them against one another, but make distinctions between one type of artist versus another. I think that Nicki Minaj is not without agency, that's not it. But in terms of representation and marketability, because that was your question, <coughs> she, her persona, the lyrics that uh, came out when she was, um, you know, guest bursting on all these different artist songs before her album ever hit, um, her identity, even as she says, no, these things are not true about me, but this is what I said was okay to say about me because it was going to garner a particular kind of attention, because it was going to make me seem like I am more desirable and, and um, even even if it's fictitious, it's a character I'm performing. That Erica Badu had her fake locks for you know, 10 years. I mean, so th these were elements of performance, so it's not to say that only belongs to but there could be a different thing too, um, and as all artists do, because this is entertainment, so this is a mask of some sort. Um, but Nicki Minaj was put out and constructed to gain mass appeal. Erica Badu and Janelle Monae have not constructed their identity to gain mass appeal. The question I have then is, are how are we um, discussing construction? Yes. Like, how do we know that Nicki Minaj is more yes. constructed yes. than Erica Badu? I'll let you, and then, yeah. I, I just have one. I just have one. I was thinking about something that you said earlier about, like, um, uh, with Monet uh, and, uh, um, I don't know what you're talking about. But focus on themselves as, um, you know, as, as French artists to a certain degree. And I was wondering if it's about, you know, presenting themselves as um, an activist. You know, and actually, by doing so, making the connection between the past, present, and the future more significant. And another artist that we I think we have had that conversation is uh, Santi Gold. You know? Yes, Santi Gold. <laughs> 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 and I, I love it like that. <laughs> because you know, performing a particular type of, uh, yeah. Yeah. of chronological you know, embodiment. As far as like how they're introducing these particular types of images, you know, making that, that that notion of being out of time you know, even more silly. Mm -hmm. okay. um, I want to see to the construction question, Seth. Um, one of the one of the challenges that I have with Minaj is that 
to try to, and I use the word romanticize for this particular reason. You want to just say, oh, she's a, she's a black rapper. When in fact, she transcends hip hop to the point where she performs various characters that are not black women. You know what I'm saying? She, she plays Roman, who's a white gay teenager. She plays Martha, yeah. who is Roman's mother, <laughs> right? Um, so I, I really find it interesting that the conversation is focusing a lot on visual culture, but I'm also more so interested in sound studies and the ways in which alienness sounds, because yeah. you know, going back to the Outkast joint, Outkast sounded like they were <coughs> associated with this Eastern representation, Western representation of hip hop. Nicki Minaj uses sound to articulate herself in such a way that's not presented within commercial hip hop and how we understand it. So I think that's one of the challenges that she presents when we're trying to categorize who she is. But I'm very curious like how this conversation would go if we're thinking about the ways in which we're sounding what aliens looks like in terms of blackness, in terms of gender. Because if we think about it from a sonic reading, it's a totally different conversation. Because there are things that are introduced within sound that aren't available within a visual or literal discourse that allows for, I guess, not necessarily a more imagined representation, but there is a construction of an alternative discourse that makes itself available that pushes us to think, that pushes us to challenge the normative constructions that we've been talking about in the conversation thus far. Can I jump off of that? Because I, I really think that's, that was brilliantly um, stated. Um, and and I, I think that the, the part of that that I've, I'm really interested in is performance, right? The performance piece. Um, and I think this is where performance studies has really helped and assisted us in doing particular types of analysis around hip hop, right? Because as long as we see, you know, hip hop as, as only a kind of African Americanist discourse, right? Then we don't understand all of the different vectors that are that are really, you know, in, are being enacted, like such as sound, right? Because one of the things about sound is we also have to be careful because that could potentially essentialize us in a particular type of way, right? So that the sound, you know, this sounds like urban music, right? Or this sounds like, you know, electronic, you know, outer space. Well, sometimes I do hear electronic outer space sounds when I'm on the bus in Chicago or wherever, DC, you know, and those sounds are really a part of the life world that we all exist in. And I think that it returns us, interestingly, to a very early turn of the 20th century moment, right, where we, we talk about the double consciousness, right? And, and, we, and we always say we're trying to move past this Du Boisian question, blah, 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 blah. But the reality is we don't escape it. And the truth is that in some ways, hip hop is really a emblem, right? of the very experience of black people, which is that it's so diverse, multiplicitous, multifarious, ugly, beautiful, terrible, all this stuff that, you know, that, that we're thinking about. And so instead of a post-blackness, I think what we're really talking about is a post-modern blackness. And we actually had a dinner conversation about this. And it just repeats itself to say that we're just in a moment where we don't quite know what we're doing. And that's okay. Like that's and that's okay. Yeah. Right? yeah. Yeah. Because as a foreign outside other, you know, living your life. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, I'm really interested in this discussion. I'm a historian, so I never get to have these discussions. So I'm just here. Um, but I was thinking as you all were talking, the thing that I'm interested in is citizenship and thinking of the alien and sort of how that affects the relationship with the relationship with the nation state. And I'm thinking of a conversation. Um, I've been hearing just sort of in various spaces about the development of UK grime and how that is sort of a response, one, to sort of the, the kind of co-optation of rap and hip hop by like black British, you know, communities, right? But then how there's a sort of moment where people are realizing that that doesn't really make sense, right? They're talking and they're rapping about, about dollars, right, and not pounds. And how that <laughs> is sort of like, that, that leads to sort of an alienation then, right? Because then with the development of crime, they're also sort of dealing with their own alienation as part of black England as in black bodies. And so I think that a lot of what you're saying here sort of moves beyond you know, this nation, right? And sort of thinking about a larger diaspora and how like hip hop is working you know, elsewhere. Can I just, hi, I saw some, some of it, I'm sorry guys, but I just wanted to say, um, <laughs> as 
as, some, as someone listening and, and taking it in, and, and what you just said um, back here uh, at a time you know, where we're experimenting, I guess, I, I want to urge you guys as scholars, I know there's a danger in naming things sometimes, but I think it's just time to put some names to things. And don't wait for anybody to name it. And maybe we can keep it alien, being in, um, intangible, but who are we waiting on to name it? Are we waiting on Dr. Drake to stand up and say, this is what I'm doing, waiting on Nicki Minaj? So let's start naming it so we can have this dialogue um, about it and not have a debate when somebody else names it and says, that's not what it is. Well, then we need to say, start saying, well, what do you think it is? Hip hop has become a word, like how y'all just said, Django's hip hop. I'm like, did I miss something? No, I went and saw a movie. You know, like what you were saying. So. What is this thing? And go ahead, we're all scholars. Let's go ahead and make up some, some new things. I know we have Af Afrofuturism, right? Let's go ahead and keep going and really claim the alienness in the space. So it's, I think it's time for some new names, and let's not wait for Webster and um, who else? Webster and all them to tell us what it is. <laughs> what it is. <laughs> Uh, I, I just want to return to the point you were making about this kind of bifurcation between punk and hip hop, um, and just kind of the deliberateness of, of you know just this kind of historiographic process of kind of crushing the complication of the history that's happened in terms of that split, and in particular thinking about something like the death grips, and and the ways in which the death grips. Um, I mean, it's always amazing to me the ways in which uh, hip hop scholars respond to the death groups as they're not hip hop. And the way that they define it as not hip hop is through these really reductive and essentialist definitions of hip hop. And in a sense, as, a, as, as kind of this posture of defense, rather than kind of appreciating that, you know, there's something so, there, there's something about the death groups that can't be recuperated, particularly even on the level of, of, of of how everyone kind of seen we want to identify them with, but even on the kind of the industrial level, the way in which they kind of wrote themselves out of their contract and their potential to be mainstream. Mm -hmm. And yet and still they, they do continue to produce. And, 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 and trying to find a way in terms of thinking critically what do we do in terms of identifying these movements, but allowing them to remain irrecuperative mm -hmm. as something like that. Mm -hmm. um. Bouncing back to the conversation on sound, I just want Matthew to jump in if you could comment on some of the, uh, the what was being said about the use of sound, and you know, I know you talked about how it shows the morality and that kind of thing. If there's anything that you have to contribute on the how we have before you mentioned that what I have been thinking about through this whole conversation is um, you know like the South is an aesthetic and how that's kind of like ASAP Rocky. But like what I what I think about too is like um, trap music, not meaning anything hip hop, but like white American like dubstep producers. And it's like a whole genre, and they have no idea what like I don't think they even know what what a trap. What a trap. <laughs> <laughs> and so, but also there's the industry panel thinking about um, the way that that trap music is this, is this other genre. But from a hip hop standpoint, this kind of aesthetic is nationalized hip hop wise, where you actually keep that to me sounds really sad. <coughs> he now has this like national kind of thing about post black, he's really not um, post black. He doesn't really have access to that in a lot of ways. And, and from an age standpoint, Gucci Man, who doesn't really have a national fan base, but is probably making more money off of music than a lot of people who are like. In the industry, and that's not. Um, I mean, I just. Yeah, to me, there's all these different spheres that are commodifiable. And Cuddy is going in a way that's commodifiable in a different way. Because um, I think that Twitter post with, um, you know, complaining about the album probably was a really good PR coup for me. Mm -hmm. well, it probably sold more, more copies of the album. So I think there's two. There's two kind of different routes. It's kind of this post-black route where there's these 360 deals where they kind of want you to be out there, even in ways that aren't necessarily commodifiable directly by the label, that promote you and your image and your brand. 
And then there's kind of other artists that are maybe less dependent on the industry, but also that don't get the attention. In a way, the attention these other artists have, like, like Gucci, where you know, his income streams or whatever are different. Um, and he has a local fan base, and then every once in a while, the, the industry will just co opt one album from that. So, I mean, I, I'm not sure what. Gucci's following is such an interesting thing to look at because, it's like, <laughs> you know, especially for um, those of you who teach majority white students. <laughs> like coming from TSU, like Gucci was God, Tennessee State University at HBC, um, Gucci was God. But then you know, so many of my students, and I'm just trying to really, I don't know what to say about it. <laughs> you know, because you know, also in a whole different way, but for maybe a hot, more obvious re reason, Cuddy has a strong cult following, like which is really more connected to me than you know. And so, and obviously, to throw it back to you, I'm curious to, um, to hear what you have to say about sound when it comes to um, Kid Cudi, because, for instance, that's one of the things that um, he said in promotion of the album. You're still going to be able to smoke weed to my, my music. It's still, you know, space. Where I said five, which he never told me or said what it was. But, yeah. And there's these two strange kind of features in where I think Cudi has a lot of times, well, he's pretty much from both of that or organic sound, even though it is kind of, Spacey, whereas I think to me a lot of the southern what's become so uh, quantifiable in the southern production aesthetic is really really um, synthetic mm -hmm. and it's really you know, different kind of you know whether you want to call something synthetic futurist is, is a different story obviously people you know there's a lot of this is about you know cheap even you know, with this is like really not a futurist in the music but I don't know claiming both I think mean, after futurism it seems to have these two these two strains of like you know, the techno and, and the different you know, DJ collectives and things like that. And kind of a more organic sound that also kind of reaches that. So, you know, it's just, yeah. so we're nearing the end of our time, but I did want to let our panelists have the last word. Thank y'all for being great co panelists. <laughs> you guys are awesome. Right. Yeah. No, these are some just really brilliant really conversations. And, um, I appreciate that there's so many people here who've already presented and were willing to bring in elements of their work and their perspectives and their discipline uh, to a, a different analysis of these conversations and that really enriched the dialogue here. So thank you. I co-sign all that. And also I actually have a request because um, as, I, as I said earlier, the Afrofuturist conversation was something that I was not already familiar with before coming to this conference. And honestly, I would like to have more conversations with any of you about the use of Twitter and how it functions, mm -hmm. you know. Social media psychology. Yeah, especially when you're talking about constructing these personas. Mm -hmm. So what I think um, I'll do for this panel, if folks are on Facebook and already liking the conference, I'll post some of these questions because it seems like we're not really done. So, and I'll post that question for you and let's see if we can continue the conversation via Facebook and Twitter. And, you know, we don't want this conference to just end this weekend. We want to keep talking. Thank you all for coming.